So Gypsy mm-hmm. Rose Blanchard is now a, a, an adult, but she was one of those children born to a mother who has what we used to call Munchausen's by proxy, where she's inventing illnesses that don't exist in the child for attention or for whatever sick reason. And she put Gypsy Rose in a wheelchair and she said Gypsy Rose had leukemia. She forced her to use an oxygen tank, even though she didn't need any of that. She said Gypsy Rose had muscular dystrophy. It's amazing that the hospital systems did not catch this. But Gypsy Rose eventually found a boyfriend on a Christian dating website. And his name, I, forgive me on the pronunciation, but I think it's Nick Godijan. And Nick Godijan, her boyfriend, quote unquote, they, it's not like, I don't think they really knew each other that well. She convinced him to murder her mom. So they worked together on it. He went into their house one night while the mother, Dee Dee, was sleeping and he stabbed her 14 times to death. So that's first degree murder. Gypsy Rose, it was very obvious these two did it. Gypsy Rose negotiated a plea where she copped to the crime and they gave her 10 years in prison. She got she just got out this month after serving seven. But Nick Godijan was sent to prison for the rest of his life without the possibility of parole. He was offered a deal. I don't know what it was. It was better than what he got. And he turned it down, preferring to take his chances with a jury. Well, that didn't, did not work out. Now, Gypsy Rose is free. She served her time. She's going on the media tour. Here's a little bit of her on The View in SOT 3. The anniversary of of the crime is actually the hardest day of the year. Do you have, are you going through psychotherapy? Yes, I am, I am. And so what I do on the anniversary is I play one of her favorite songs Mm -hmm. and I allow myself that time to cry. And I mean, ball cry Mm. because I feel like I can't do it in front of other people because I'm afraid of being judged for it because they're probably going to make some kind of snarky comment like, well, you killed her. Um, But I'm like, you know, she was my mom and I miss her even though everything that she did to me, she was still my mother. I had spent 24 years of my life with her. Okay, so there she is um, out of prison. But the problem in this case is that the co-defendant is still in prison and seeking a new trial. And what he's saying is that his he had ineffective assistance of counsel because his lawyer did not find a qualified neuropsychologist specializing in autism spectrum disorder to support the diminished capacity defense of Godijan, of Nick Godijan, of whom we have some video. You can see it here. So they say Nick Godijan has low IQ, that he's on the autism spectrum, and it's pretty significant. Let's watch it. Basically, it was an angel and a devil. I actually had two different ones speaking to me. They both said one thing and left the decision up to me. Had that time devil. What they ended up telling me was, uh, this bitch is dead. That's all it said, this bitch is dead. Basically, once I heard that uh, uh, some darn reason I don't know why it inflamed the uh, emotion of rage but it did it it inflamed the emotion of rage so I ended up whispering to Gypsy get in the bathroom because I just want to get this over with Mm. I mean you can see this guy's not you know not firing on all cylinders necessarily. So anyway, he's claiming he should have had a lawyer argue that and should have put on a qualified expert to tell the jury, this guy's not of adequate mental capacity to be even sitting here and he belongs in a mental facility, not jail for the rest of his life without parole. Mark, could he, could he make well, the case? They, they're, making, they're making the case now basically of ineffective assistance of counsel. And it's tough. So it's, it's a tough claim but they they may get some traction. I mean, as you just indicated, it's obvious that there is some, you know, this is a jurisdiction that still has diminished capacity here in California. We eliminated it. And so what diminished capacity is, is you're basically talking about the ability to form a mens rea. And, uh, and you know, you feel for this guy because 
he turned down an offer, as you had indicated, that was better than what ended up happening to him, which is often the case. You get the trial penalty if you go and lose. I, uh, I, I suppose that somebody at some point may um, decide that uh, this guy probably should have uh, had the benefit of some other uh, expert at his disposal. But this is a story often told, unfortunately. Hmm. I don't know, John. I mean, like, does it does it affect a court to see? Obviously, this I don't know whether he's just I don't know what's wrong with him. He doesn't sound totally right. But the autism right. thing, how everybody knows somebody with autism or has a kid with autism. It doesn't make you murder. It doesn't make you easily manipulatable into murder. So I'm not sure. Like, how does the court factor that in in deciding whether this expert not testifying rendered counsel ineffective? Yeah, and I, I look at it this way, not finding an expert to say that is different from not looking for an expert to say that. So mm. let's suppose his defense counsel did look for an expert to say that, and he interviewed 10 and 10 said, I can't say that. Now what do you do, right? So now mm. you, now you, maybe you have to change your defense strategy. Maybe you talk to your client and say, you know, if you're competent enough to understand what I'm saying, you need to take a deal. And when the client says no deal, how are you incompetent? Now, if you don't bother looking and you have a client who clearly might have some mental infirmity and you don't look, okay, perhaps there is some there there in the incompetence argument. But dang, I would think that this person probably had to take the stand in his trial to explain himself. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, and, and if he did, jurors would have, uh, you know, a lot to chew on listening to him testify if he sounds much like he did in that clip, but maybe he didn't take the stand. I mean, it's quite possible he didn't, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I, I think the other thing that really makes you think is, okay, so the person who planned and plotted and hired me walks in seven years and I'm doing life, you know, on the one hand, it makes sense because you're a hit man and you should do life. You weren't the one who was abused for your entire life. And on the other hand, there is something that's a little untoward about it when he was hired by somebody and, and she mm -hmm. got so little time. You know, it's and an interesting about, yeah, ahead, point John makes about the the person who gets hired versus the person who's actually um, the subject of the abuse, because I've seen uh, prosecutors take completely uh, different positions on that. Sometimes they, they'll they try to turn the person who actually does the actual killing against who hired them and with the justification that, that that's the person who's actually more culpable as opposed to kind of the, what happened here, which is the person who was. Well, obviously, the only reason uh, they didn't do that, Mark, is because Gypsy Rose was abused by this woman for all this time. So they're not looking at her the way they'd look at a regular daughter who took a hit out on her mom. But shouldn't that abuse factor in for him as well? Well, I I think yes. And I'll tell you, one of the, I guess, the, I step back and take more of a macro look. One of the things when you're talking, whether it's diminished capacity, which is now outlawed in California, or it's one of these, these mens rea defenses, generally what you're looking for in a criminal case is some vehicle, whether it's diminished capacity, whether it's imperfect self-defense, you're looking for something to give a jury the ability to say, we understand, we don't, we don't approve of this, um, but we get why you did it, that you're trying to just give them a vehicle to at least uh, hear you out, hear your client out, have some empathy for your client and give them and reduce the idea of malice, which is required for murder. And that's uh, what's what's happening here. You're trying to find a vehicle uh, now by using stepping back and saying it was a, uh, ineffective assistance to counsel, but trying to find a vehicle to get to the result, which is that he shouldn't be in for the rest of his life. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Leo Grillo. Leo was on a road trip and came across a Doberman. This dog was severely underweight and clearly in trouble, and Leo rescued him and named him Delta. Sadly, as you know, Delta is just one of so many animals that needed and continued to need help. And that inspired Leo to start Delta Rescue, the largest no-kill, that's important to listen for, care for life animal sanctuary in the world. They have rescued thousands of dogs, cats, and horses from the wilderness 
and they provide their animals with shelter, love, safety, and a home. It's dedication and everlasting love to animals. That's Leo's mission and his legacy. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions to stay open. And if you would like caring for these animals to be part of your legacy, speak with your estate planner because there are tax-saving estate planning benefits to you as well. You can grow your estate while letting your love for animals live well into the future. Check out the estate planning tab on their website to learn more and speak with your advisor. We call dog a man's best friend for a reason. You can help those who need it most. Visit deltarescue.org today to learn more. That's deltarescue.org. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.